it. So now the blue comes, he's kind of just dead. This pack is really close. I actually won't be surprised if anybody from the bottom six oh, just kind of jumped. Oh, oh shit! Oh. Wait, that bomb is gonna be sauce. Is that bomb be sauce? <laughs> 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 So, yeah, I like the John tournament quite a bit, if you can't tell already. Uh, I think it actually may solve a few problems in the community for us, given some time, if we were to run more of them. So, I want to talk today about what went well. So, if you've been around the Mario Kart 8 scene for the last few years, you've probably noticed that MKC does not run as many FFA tournaments as we used to. I think it's a little sad, but here's the reality. The new Summit FFAs that, you know, mainly cater to the Japanese crowd are just better tournaments for people who are serious about the game and want to face off against top-level competition. There's nothing much we can do to make better tournaments of better top player representation, and the thing that's rough for American players in particular is, like, that's at 8 a.m., so, like, you have to choose to wake up, give up your Saturday morning that you normally sleep in on if you want to do a Summit free-for-all. And... Not everybody wants to do that. I certainly don't that frequently. I've done it once or twice. But despite this, I don't think that FFA tournaments or, you know, free-for-alls at different time slots are a lost cause. So last Friday, John, or JP Gibbner, as many of you all know him, decided to run a prize pool free-for-all tournament in the evening for the U.S., and it got, like, 84 entrants. It was a fun time that, you know, I hope can be repeated in the future. So outside of, you know, the better time slot for me personally and a lot of other people, what made it unique? Uh, some might immediately point to the prize pool, but I think if anything, that was kind of like the cherry on top. Uh, maybe a cash prize draws a few people in, but there are more things to talk about here than just, you know, cash prizes. And I'd personally love a sequel even if there was no cash prize attached. I know I was like close to, you know, getting some sort of prize, but that's not really what I think the benefit is here. I think that the stream was, you know, the part that was worth focusing on. Uh, stream popped off in terms of viewership, and that was even like in a nighttime slot where all the European players were likely asleep, except for the ones that actually stayed up and played. And while a lot of it may have been people wanting to check out something new, I think it's more than just that. Now, we've had, like, traditional casts for a while. You guys probably watch a few if you watch my channel. It's mainly for the team tournaments these days, and they usually run on MKC, and as a result, they, like, it requires some professionalism, right? Uh, on someone's personal Twitch, though, you know, they make the rules, and this gave things a unique vibe, in my opinion, and potentially one that appeals to, you know, the American crowd a little bit more than just, you know, a more formal cast. Now, I've observed how the community operates for a bit now, and I safely can say that there are some, you know, different cultures within. Uh, the Japanese community appears to be more focused on individual skills and prefers, a, you know, a more try-hard setting, and I think they probably care about improvement a bit more than we do, you know. And the lounge stats really show it, I would say. You know, there's a disproportionate amount of high-level Japanese players compared to most other countries in the scene, and also a disproportionate amount of Japanese players in the lounge like just in general and I think it's reasonable to say that things like lounge grind and you know the summit free-for-alls appeal to the Japanese players more than it does the average you know American player over in the States I think it's definitely different because you know it's not that like, it's not that dedicated players don't queue up in the lounge from time to time but it definitely seems that more of us dislike it maybe this is just coming from the perspective where I know all the American players personally but I don't know uh, players like Brandon you know Tatum People have been on Team USA before, like they don't play lounge literally like at all. And I would say that the tryhard nature is especially off-putting to some mid to low level players as well. There's a stigma about Mario Kart in the West that we kind of have to fight, to be honest with y'all. It's not a widely accepted esport right now, and I could be wrong, but it appears to me that even, you know, very low level Japanese players kind of like, they, they have a lot of respect for like, you know, the top players in Japan and what they do and accomplish. And I'm not here to say that, you know, dedicated U.S. players deserve, like, the same recognition. But I just want to talk about the stark contrast. Because being skilled in this game is oftentimes not seen in a positive light at all. And the average player interested in Mario Kart who doesn't understand the appeal of top-level competitions, mainly, you know, the people that are from the U.S. speak English, etc. Like, they don't 
understand the appeal of our top level competitions and just see us as a bunch of nerds that would ruin their worldwide lobbies if we got into it. And that's just how it is, whether, you know, that's true or not. I know some people like worldwiding a bit more, but I don't know. I think there's a little bit of a misconception there in general. And this is how it's unfortunately going to remain until the community gains more exposure and respect from the outside. And this really all started back in Mario Kart DS with the snaking. You know, people did it online, and players thought that snaking was for cheaters just because, you know, those players practiced techniques that made them better. People have always rationalized in their mind that this game is a no-seal game no matter what evidence is, like, you know, shown to them. So, if someone that they play against is genuinely good, they'll never actually credit that. They'll just think that they're no fun. A friend even told me recently that, a while back ago, he participated in a tournament at a convention, I think it was, a few years back for Mario Kart 8 Wii U version. Keep in mind, you know, this is a tournament, you enter to try to win, and what I was told is that after fire hopping for the first time, his opponent just stared at him, got up and left. It was like, hostile, and it's like, come on, man. And, you know, there's been other cases, I know there's, like, been streamers before, they just like, yo, if you, if you fire up in my rooms, you get deleted, you're not, you're not part of, like, the, the community anymore, we don't, we, we race the right way and stuff like that. And, like, these may be extreme examples, but, like, this type of hostility could continue for as long as, you know, the game continues to be misunderstood. And the good news is that it is possible to change a narrative, I think we're kind of underway of doing that already. It may be more difficult for us, but, you know, like, casual players, like, find things like wave dashing and melee cool, despite it being a game-breaking tech. It's just, like, I mean, maybe that wouldn't have gone over so well, like, if it was, like, a Wi-Fi game that wasn't out in 2001, but who knows. But I think the point is, is that it is possible to shift, like, how people look at the game. Going back to the stream, though, I think what made this a very cool experience was that it was fun and genuine. Not to say that other things weren't, but... There's a lot of val like there's a lot of value in having a dedicated cast on Mario Kart Central, you know. There's some professionalism involved in those. But that's not gonna do anything for anyone who thinks that the game isn't really worth their time, right? A cast that is more loose and less tryhard and full of laughs may be a bit different, right? Uh, the vibe is just completely different. It's more casual and welcoming and even inviting, I would say. It's not, you know, as scary, it's not using all these terms that people may not know. Well, maybe it is, but it's like a, hey, we'll interact with the chat and t and explain things kind of thing, if necessary. It was something that I think anyone could join in for, join in, you know, for some good entertainment, and that's exactly what we should be aiming for, I think. Good content that makes people interested in the competition itself. Now, what's ironic here is that despite, you know, the mood that I think the stream gave off, this was a money tournament and the players were definitely tryharding. The stream dictated the entire mood. Like, in my opinion, this is a very good way of showcasing, you know, top talent to outsiders in a fun setting that doesn't come off as condescending or tryhard. And I think there's a lot of value if a stream that, you know, showcases a group of guys just like watching stuff, having legitimate fun, you know, just watching competitive MK. And, you know, popping off when players do cool things or have a plan backfire or accidentally throw a bomb forward and have it blow up the person that threw a red shell at them. And with this all in mind, I think our free-for-all tournaments like these just have entirely different goals than the Summit FFAs that we talked about earlier. They're not outclassed, these kinds of tournaments that John ran, and that justifies their existence, in my opinion at least. Like, they aren't worse, they just aim to capture different audiences entirely. And it's no surprise to me that this stream had a higher viewership peak than most free-for-alls get on MKC, which are, you know, less popular than watching actual clan wars and stuff on the platform. But this tournament had its own niche, and despite a nighttime slot, it was good entertainment that reached a lot of people, even though, you know, a lot of the community wasn't even awake when it happened. Uh, this is a personal note also, but I was surprised that my stream was even selected for the semifinals, given that I was streaming with my cam, because, you know, for normal casts, this would be a disqualifier, because normal casts just need proper gameplay and audio only, because the commentary team is going to do, you know, the content side of it already. But this didn't deter John's stream from hosting me, though, in the end. And I think this made it actually a pretty fun watch, at least my round. I know I got kind of some luck, and that made it kind of funny. But, you know, having not just John on stream, but me also reacting to my own play, and them reacting to me, I think that's funny. And it kind of provided a human element to this game, 
And I think that gets lost in a setting that feels more robotic, which, you know, you can sometimes argue that Summit and, you know, Lounge can come across as at times. And I'd say that laughter is infectious, right? And interestingly enough, directly after the stream, my personal viewership on Twitch has been up this week, and I want to say it kind of feels loosely related. Uh, this kind of vibe, the player turnout and top player representation that produce a legitimately engaging finals, is, in my opinion, the exact blueprint we should want to follow for our community lands in the future. And man, that just sounds so Imagine like just going out to something just having 80 different players from across the community that will just all care about this game, having fun. And I think that's what appeals to the US player base. You know, we've seen it in Smash, there's a human element to this game. You know, communicating, talking with people, have, you know, just having a laugh. And I think that is the goals that you know we should be going after. I really do believe that players in the US are attracted to more casual settings, at least at first. And with the right marketing, I think there's a lot of untapped potential here. You could get some amateur brackets, you know, set up for these FFAs. This could be something special that appeals to players interested in getting into the scene or participating in a tournament series that they've watched on Twitch before, but it could maybe finally give it could give them that final push of momentum that they needed to really just try it out for the first time. So yeah, and also, you know, AM brackets, finding ways to make it more engaging for new players, that comes with that, that, that comes with it, of course, you know, if you really want people to uh, want to give things a spin like this. Now, I know we had a free-for-all tournament series on Friday nights last year, and it went okay, and I think if we were to go back to that, I think we should maybe try to focus on repeating some of the magic, you know, from last Friday. And of course, this won't all be easy. You know, to run a stream, some people have to sacrifice, right? Because you need people to make the content happen that aren't playing. But, all, all without all things said, I'm really excited to see if this can happen again. Or if it could, you know, be something that's sustainable without cash prizes. And who knows, maybe John finds a way to, you know, fundraise for it. But I don't even think that's needed. I think we just need something, you know, that kind of brings the scene together. So, in summary, awesome time. Hope that there's more of it in the future. <laughs>